we are hoping and we are praying and we are looking forward to a baptism. Um, and so if you are interested in being baptized, if you have recently accepted Christ or if you, you have kind of been thinking about, you know, I've had a relationship with Jesus, but I haven't really moved forward in baptism and you want to have a dialogue or you have some questions, um, we are hoping that next week we would actually have a baptism, um, and there's several of you that I know are thinking through it and that we've talked to a little bit about, and so if you are interested in that, you can email chad at secondmi.org. It's really easy to find on the website um, if you didn't catch it that time, or you can come talk to me after the gathering, and you can say, hey, I'm interested. Do you have time to talk this week? Because um, we would love to um, partner with you and to join and celebrate with you what God is doing in your heart as you publicly say, I am a follower of Jesus and I want to be part of what he's doing um, throughout the city and then even uh, moving through this body. So if baptism is something you are thinking or considering, please, please, please talk to me about that. If you know anything about me, you know that I'm a word guy. I enjoy words. I enjoy learning new words. Um, Angel and I Often through our relationship, I would say something and she, say, she would say, that's not a word. And I'd say, oh, yes, it is. And she'd say, no, it's not. And she's the English major. or She's not a major, but she taught English. Um, and I am not. Um, I've gotten better as I've gotten older. But, um, and she, we'd have this argument and I'd say, yes, it is. Look it up. And she'd look it up. And guess who was right? Yes, me. Um, and so I enjoy words. I'm not always right, just most of the time. No, not at all. Um, so there's a new word this week that I want us to learn. I've learned this week. It's not like it was in my repertoire for a really long time, and then I'm like wowing you with my intelligence. No, I specifically looked up in the thesaurus this word for this occasion, and it's in the title, a unique and intention intentional, I can't even speak, a unique and intentional a dumbrate. You're like, what? A dumbrate. That's the word. Um, and we'll define it as you write down uh, the title. And we're going, as I said, to be in Hebrews chapter 7, verses 1 through 28. Yep, that's the whole chapter. Um, even if you don't believe me, we are going to get through it. And this is what a dumbrate means. It means to produce a faint image or resemblance of to outline or to sketch, to foreshadow or prefigure. So as you think about this cool word that you can, you know, really show the vastness of your intelligence as you talk to people this week and you use this in your vocabulary um, and you make it sound really, really exciting, um, that this is the concept of what we are going to talk about this evening in chapter 7, that what we are going to learn about a specific individual that the author of Hebrews has already mentioned a couple different times is that he, in fact, is an adumbrate. He is producing a faint image. He is a resemblance of. He is meant to outline or to sketch or to foreshadow or to be a prefigure of Jesus. Now, just as a side note, if you have been part of Second Mile for a long time or only part of Second Mile for a little bit of time, what you'll notice is we put a lot of stuff on the screen. In fact, we put so much stuff on the screen that we have two, that has two different things on them so that you can kind of keep up with what's happening. And the intention is not necessarily for you to have to write everything down that shows up on the screen. If you want to write everything down that shows up on the screen, great. But we put stuff on the screen, n number one, so that you can follow along and so that you can kind of move forward and trying to capture all of your senses, not just listening to me, but watching and, and understanding where we're going. But it's meant for you to actually take the notes that you feel like the Holy Spirit is leading you to take so that during the week, you have something to reference to say, this is what I'm learning. This is what I'm processing. This is what I wanted to remember based on what Chad said or based on what this passage means. And so even though we put a lot of stuff on the screen, I hope that you know that it's not meant for you just to write it all down, but to really understand the, the, the movement of the passage so that you can then apply it to your everyday life. You see, the concept of the priesthood of Jesus is important. 
This man that we're going to talk about shortly is that a dumbrate of Jesus. And the priesthood of Jesus is important. In fact, it is key to understanding two other big words that we talk a lot about in Second Mile, justification and sanctification. Justification means that when Jesus died on the cross, he justified us in terms of he took our place and the wrath of God went on Christ instead of us so that we can enjoy being in the presence of God. If you have entered into a relationship with Jesus, then you have been justified because he has taken your place. You see, in order to understand the priesthood of Jesus, it moves us into a, into a conversation of justification. It also moves us into that other big word that we talk a lot about here at Second Mile, which is sanctification. And both words are not meant to scare you. In fact, they're beautiful as they move us into a relationship with Jesus. Sanctification is the fact that if I'm being obedient to the presence of God in my life, I am always changing. And I am always changing towards an image bearer of Jesus. I'm becoming more and more and more and more like Jesus. In fact, if you were with family this week and they said, hey, you didn't used to act that way. You act kind of different now. Amen. Because that is sanctification. That means that you are changing. The old is gone and the new has come. And there's something about you that's different. And that something about you is the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life that's causing you to change. So in order to understand the key component of Jesus' priesthood, we must understand justification and sanctification. You see, the author of Hebrews wants the reader, us, and his original audience to understand the importance, which is why he continually brings up the concept of priesthood. And he explains it using, here's the guy's name, Melchizedek as an example. If we look back through Hebrews, look back at chapter 2, verse 17. Chapter 2, verse 17 says, Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. There's that justification element. There's that sanctification element. Then again in chapter 3, verse 1, Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession. This is a guy who's drawing us into a concept. What's the concept? The high priesthood of Jesus. Again, in chapter 4, verse 14, he brings it up. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. Again, chapter 5, verse 6. As he says also in another place, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. We'll get back to that quote tonight because it's a quote from Psalm 110. But again, the idea of priesthood is mentioned in chapter 5, verse 10, one more time, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Now, verse 11 of chapter 5 says, After this, we have much to say, and it's hard to explain since you've become dull of hearing. You see, we've spent the last few weeks talking from chapter 5, verse 11, through all of chapter 6, getting us ready to hear the message that is tonight. Because the original author of Hebrews, speaking to the original audience of Hebrews, pauses and he's, he's going on his line of thought. Priesthood, great priesthood. Consider Jesus, priesthood. We need to understand the priesthood of Jesus. And then he stops and realizes, wait. I don't know if you guys are ready to hear this. So he pauses and says, okay, you might be dull of hearing. Let's, let's go backwards and let's make sure that you understand what God is doing through his son, Christ. And so chapter 6 is moved into the element to prepare us then for chapter 7. So here it is, chapter 7. For this, Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham, returning from the slaughter of the kings, and blessed him. And to him Abraham apportioned a tenth part of everything. 
He is first, by translation of his name, king of righteousness, and then he is also king of Salem, that is, king of peace. He is without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God, he continues a priest forever. See how great this man was to whom Abraham, the patriarch, gave a tenth of his spoils, and those descendants of Levi who received the priestly office have a commandment in the law to take tithes from the people, that is, from their brothers, though these also are descended from Abraham. But this man, who does not have his descendant from them, received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. It is beyond dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior. In the one case, tithes are received by mortal men, but in the other case, by one of whom it is testified that he lives." One might even say that Levi himself, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, for he, will still, for he was still in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. Now, I'm going to pause for just a second. I'm going to explain all that in, in a little bit. But if you're like me, when I first picked up the Bible and opened it and said, oh, let's see, what does Hebrews chapter 7 have to say? For this Melchizedek king... Of Salem, priest of uh, Abraham, genealogy, great man, but the tithes, loins. <laughs> loins? Really? Chapter 8. Now the point, right? I mean, you read this and you're like, ah, ugh, really? Is there something important here? I mean, what do I have to know that is found in chapter 7? We'll get there. It's exciting. It really is. Verse 11. Now, if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, now you're like, you lost me again. For under it, the people received the law. What further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek rather than the one named after the order of Aaron? For whom there is a charge in the priesthood, there is a necessarily a change in the law as well. For the one of whom these things are spoken belonged another tribe from which no one has ever served at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah, and in connection with that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. This becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become a priest, not on the basis of a legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. For it is witnessed of him, here's that quote again of Psalm 110, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For on the one hand, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness, for the law made nothing perfect. But on the other hand, a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. Now I know you're like, is he ever going to finish this chapter? And it was not without an oath. For those who formerly became priests were made such without an oath, but this one was made a priest with an oath by the one whom said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, you are a priest forever. This makes Jesus the guarantor of, better, of a better covenant. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Verse 25 is key, and we're going to camp out on that um, again. I've given you a lot of things we're going to camp out on. Consequently, he is able, speaking of Jesus, to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily. This should ring a bell. We've already kind of went through this. First for his own sins, and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself, the crucifixion, for the law appoints him in their weakness as high priest, but the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. Now, the reason what you heard me say was blah, 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 is because you aren't an Israelite. Because you didn't grow up in a Jewish home that was ingrained in you, this is Abraham. This is the father of all fathers. This is the role of the people. This is your role as a child of Abraham. Do you get it? Do you understand it? And what we say as children not of 
the genealogy of Abraham, but of another way, we say, I don't get this. And in order to get it, we must understand the history that comes through the Old Testament. Melchizedek is mentioned three times in Scripture. The first, he's mentioned in Genesis 14, which Hebrews 7 alludes to when it talks about after he had defeated four kings. The story of him invading and being part, Abraham being part of invading these four kings is found in Genesis 14. So Genesis 14 gives us historical parameters of this person, Melchizedek. The second time that Melchizedek is mentioned is through David, and David mentions him in Psalm 110.4, which has been quoted in Hebrew several times. Psalm 110.4 then gives us a prophetic word concerning who Melchizedek is foreshadowing, or use our vocabulary word, a dumbbrate. So this is what Melchizedek is meant to do, which is the prophetic word meaning that's found in Psalm 110.4. And the third and final place that Melchizedek is mentioned is in Hebrews. He's mentioned several times, but he's explained the most in Hebrews chapter 7, and it's meant to be a theological explanation right up all of our alley, right? I mean, we love this stuff. So now we move into the history. Now, instead of going back and reading Genesis 14 and getting all bogged down into detail, I'll give you the highlights. Here's the spark notes of Genesis 14. Here it is. Melchizedek was the king of Salem. Most likely that means he was the king of Jerusalem. Salem was another name given to the city of Jerusalem. He was a priest in addition to a king. That's not normal. In fact, the Levitical law says that the priest should not be the king and the king should not be the priest. And if you look at King Saul, he gets in trouble in trying to do priestly things because he's the king. So this is not a normal situation. This is a very different and unique situation. But nonetheless, Melchizedek is explained to be both king of Salem and a priest of the Most High God. Abraham had gone after four kings that had taken his nephew Lot and his family captive when they raided, raided Sodom. Lot had gone into Sodom, and long story short, he gets held captive, and Abraham says, my nephew, I need to go after him. I need to rescue him. This is before Sodom and Gomorrah is destroyed. This is right when Lot and Abraham are going to separate. If you remember me talking about Abraham a couple of weeks ago, you kind of get the history a little bit. You can kind of remember, kind of Move back into your brain, Abraham, Lot. Oh yeah, how's God going to bless Abraham? Is it going to be through Lot? Is it going to be through this? No, so Lot now is in Sodom, held captive, and Abraham is going to invade, and he defeats these four kings. As he defeats these kings, he recovers all the goods that he brought back from Lot and his family, and as Abraham returns from this battle, Melchizedek came out to meet him. And as Melchizedek came out to meet him, he blessed Abraham. And then Abraham gave Melchizedek a tenth of the spoils that came from the war. Now, if you want to read about all these details, you can read about it in Genesis 14. It's great, good reading. Now, there's the history. We then move into the explanation that Hebrews chapter 7 gives us of who this Melchizedek is, starting in verse 1. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham returning from the slaughter. Now it starts to make sense because we remember Genesis 14 of the kings, and then he blessed him. And then verse 2, and to him Abraham apportioned a tenth part of everything, all of the spoils from the battle. He is first by translation of his name, king of righteousness, and then he's also king of Salem, that is king of peace. He is without father or mother. It goes into explaining who Melchizedek is. So, Verse 2 starts us creating a character profile of Melchizedek. Melchizedek was a righteous king. Now that's important because where Jerusalem was geographically makes it hard for kings to be righteous. You see, the surrounding areas were surrounded by kings who were very, and in fact, the most ungodly. Sodom on one side and the Canaanites on the other, both enemies of God. Yet God raised up Melchizedek to be a witness in the middle of this moral depravity to declare the fame of God. 
Melchizedek is a king surrounded by other kings that have no interest in following the God of Israel. And yet, this king is serving the God of Abraham. As we get further involved into the name Melchizedek, Melchi is my king. Zedek is righteousness in Hebrew. As you think through, even his very name means something about his character. He is a king, but not just a king. He is a righteous king, and he's a king of Salem. Salem is another word that is derived from shalom, which is the word where we get peace. And so he is the king of righteousness and peace. Now we're starting to connect the pieces of this puzzle By now, you have the outline of the puzzle. It's still chaotic. There's still 995, 980 pieces. Maybe it takes 20 pieces to make the border. 980 pieces still in a pile in the box. But there you are, and you're starting to make sense of this thing that at first you were like, blah, 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 blah. Righteousness must be understood and experienced before an individual can truly experience peace. Let me say that again. Righteousness must fully be understood and experienced before an individual can truly experience peace. We live in a world that is wanting to find peace. Internal peace, external peace, national border peace, family peace. I mean, we can talk about peace until we're blue in the face. There's something deep within us that wants rest, that wants peace. But unless we consider righteousness first, we will never truly understand peace. There's a reason Melchizedek is mentioned as a king of righteousness who then is a king of a place called peace. Paul talks about this concept in Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Romans 5, verse 1 says, Therefore, since we have been justified, there's that word, justification, by faith, since we have experienced righteousness, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. What Paul is saying is for your spirit for your soul, for you to be a complete person, you need to embrace the King of all kings, the Lord of all lords, Jesus Christ, and as you embrace him and are justified by him, then you experience this beautiful glimpse of righteousness, and by experiencing righteousness, then you begin to find peace. Once your heart is aligned with God, Peace can be had. So here's the first question for you this evening. Are you trying to discover peace? Maybe another way to ask that question is, do you look at yourself as a peace-filled person? Would you describe yourself as a peaceful person? As you think about that and as you marinate on the concept of your own personal discovery of peace, in that process, in that journey, have you discovered Jesus first? We're going to talk about this a little more, even for those who would immediately say, yes, I know Jesus. I've known Jesus for a long time. I remember that time when I was in sixth grade, and this person invited me to this church thing, and I went to this church thing, and there was something inside of me that said, you need to move, and you need to make a decision to follow Jesus. And I hold on to that, but here I'm over here struggling, and I'm not a very peace-filled person, and I don't know how to make the two meld together. Well, what about now? Are you exploring? Are you searching? Are you considering Jesus first prior to considering peace? And then the next question is a follow-up with all of those things. Are you willing to take the risk and trust Jesus? Are you willing to look at Scripture? Are you willing to listen to your friends who 
when you watch their life, when you observe how they manage their family, when you see the joy that erupts internally, even when externally things seem a little chaotic, are you willing to say to yourself, hmm, this Jesus, it seems risky, but it also seems worth it. Now, for some of you, you're like, Chad, I know this. I've been a follower of Jesus for a long time, but I think even if we have followed Jesus for 5, 10, 15, 25 years, we need to ask ourselves a question. When we're searching for peace, do we start with Jesus? Where is Jesus captivating you today? Here's more character qualities. Number one, he was the king of righteousness and peace. That's Melchizedek. Number two, he is without beginning and without end. Verse three talks about that. In addition to his character, we're going to jump around a lot now, so we're not going to go sequentially through all of chapter seven. So he's without beginning and without end. Verse three, he's also indestructible. Verse 16, and he never needs to be replaced, verse 23 and 24. Now, we've just skipped all around. You're like, oh, he is going to finish. Or not, because you know me better. All right. So, this is another part of the character development of Melchizedek. Being a priest in Israel, if you know the history, was totally dependent on your family lineage. All priests, if you know your Bible history, all priests came from a specific tribe. And that specific tribe was the tribe of Levi. It was the Levites. If you were born in the tribe of Levi, which you were labeled then a Levite, you ministered to all the other people of the tribes, the 12 tribes. So there's 12 tribes of the God of Israel, and so those 12 tribes were divided, and there was one specific tribe that wasn't given land, and the specific tribe that wasn't given land was the Levites, because they were to manage the affairs of God by being the priests. So they weren't given opportunity to make a living on their own. They depended on the giving of the other tribes, and then they served the nation of Israel as priests. So all priests from the tribe of Levi, that's where priests came from. No one else need apply. If you could not establish your family heritage, you were excluded from the priesthood. Genealogy, 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 family lineage, family lineage, family lineage. Oh, I know you. You are a direct descendant of Aaron, Moses' brother, the first priest. I get it. No need for any others to apply you are a Levite. Nehemiah chapter 7, verses 61 through 64 gives some background to that. But Melchizedek in chapter 7 of Hebrews is mentioned, and when he's mentioned, it's very specifically outlined that he's without father and mother and without genealogy. All this talk about genealogy, all this talk about you have to be a Levite, you have to be a Levite, you have to be a Levite, and then here's Melchizedek, a king and a priest but his priestly lineage does not follow that of Levi. Now, if it isn't confusing enough already, you have to put yourself in Eastern methods of arguing a point. Which, guess what? It's not the Western way to think about it. All of us are Western all of us come from kind of a Greek-Roman system of philosophy. It's how we make sense of the world. But Asians and Middle Easterners, they think about the world very differently. They look at the world much differently than Westerners. And the author of Hebrews is speaking to an Eastern culture. And so the author is building an argument from silence. So follow me as we build this argument of silence. Notice, father's not mentioned, mother's not mentioned, without beginning, without end. Why is there ambiguity coming to the lineage of Melchizedek? Well, if Genesis is all about the importance of genealogies, which it is, when you read the book of Genesis, there's genealogy after genealogy after genealogy, this beget this, this beget this, this beget this, and it's important who you're linked to but Melchizedek's family is not mentioned. An argument from silence. His time of death is not mentioned. 
What the author of Hebrews in his theological argument, remember that's what Hebrews is about concerning Melchizedek, he's representing a perpetual priesthood. He's saying there was this real guy. This real guy was the king of righteousness, the king of peace. This was a guy that was king and he had a peaceful place. He existed in a realm of chaos. He existed in a realm of corruption. But God had put Melchizedek in this place to show his fame and his glory and his resounding interest in people. But in the description of Melchizedek, even in Genesis 14, there's no mention of how he is king and how he is priest. And as the author of Hebrews brings him up, he doesn't then go to the books and say, well, see, Melchizedek is a priest because his father was so-and-so, and he can trace his roots to so-and-so. In fact, Scripture is completely absent of details. And so the Eastern mind is saying, what is present, catch this, in the absence of detail. Now, we don't think that way, but they think that way. And so, as they ask the question, what is present in the absence of details, what they land on is that because Genesis puts such an emphasis on lineage, and because Melchizedek's lineage is not explained, then it's representing a priesthood that continues forever. And so, now let's compare it with the great high priest, Jesus. This Melchizedek resembles the Son of God. You see, Jesus' human lineage, which is given in the New Testament, but Jesus' human lineage is not linked to the Levites either. Where does Jesus come from? He comes from King David, the tribe of Judah. So Jesus is the great high priest, but guess what? Jesus doesn't have the qualifications of the priesthood either. Now it's starting to make sense. Melchizedek is the adumbrate of Jesus. He is a king and a priest. You need to consider him when you think about the characterization of Jesus because Jesus is not from the Levites either. Jesus, not, Jesus is not of the Aaronic priestly order. He is a kingly priestly order as the Son of God. Now what we know about Jesus, what we know about his character, what we know about the one and only begotten Son of God is that he is forever. He did not have a beginning. He does not have an end. When you read Hebrews chapter 1, that's the whole point. Jesus is supreme. And so the author of Hebrews is saying, like Melchizedek, Jesus lives forever. He is currently sitting at the right hand of the Father. He and only he has the ability to be an active, never-ending priest and king. The silence that is given to the details of Melchizedek is fast-forwarded, is given to a foretaste of, guess what, Jesus, which is what Psalm 114 says, you are a priest forever. After who? After that guy that was mentioned only two other times in Scripture, Melchizedek. The deity of Jesus secures his indestructible priesthood for us. Now, I know this seems a little heady, but this is so important, and we'll get to application in just a second. Melchizedek is a king of righteousness and peace. Melchizedek is without beginning and without end in terms of the lineage that is explained. He goes on forever, which a quality that's given to him is indestructible. He never needs to be replaced because the Levites always had to be replaced because guess what? They died. And so another person had to come to be the priest. The other description of Melchizedek is that he's greater than Abraham and Levi. That's where all of that other detail comes, starting in verse 4. See how great this man was to whom Abraham the patriarch gave a tenth of his spoils and those descendants of Levi who received the priestly office that a commandment in the law to take tithes from his people on and on and on. But then it goes down. One might even say that Levi himself who receives tithes paid tithes through Abraham for he was still in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. What that means is 
Levi, which is a descendant of Abraham, wasn't even alive yet, but because Abraham, the forefather, gave tithes to Melchizedek, then it means all the descendants after Abraham in Eastern thought also were to give tithes to whom Abraham had given tithes to. Abraham, the father of a nation, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make your nation great. I'm going to start my work among people with you, Abraham. In Genesis 12, a friend of God, the father of the Israel nation, humbles himself before Melchizedek. Abraham saw something great in Melchizedek and spontaneously recognizes that God had sent this man and he was to give a tenth of his possessions from the victory that God had granted him over these four kings to Melchizedek. The third point of greater than Abraham and Levi, Levi, who was Abraham's great-grandson, gave tithes to Melchizedek through Abraham's tithes. Now, I just explained that, but Paul talks about it in a different way in Romans chapter 5, verse 12, when he says to us, He uses the same type of Eastern thinking when he says, when Adam sinned, the entire human race sinned. It's the connection. We are connected to what God is doing in humanity. And when the first man and woman sinned and turned their back on God, then original sin enters the world and you and I are born sinful. That's the theological concept that comes out of this. So Levi, the whole nation, the whole tribe of Levi, the Levites, who are set aside to be God's priests, they in turn, throughout all of their history, are giving tithes to Melchizedek. That's how great he is. Now I know it's details, but we're getting to the application. Verse 25, here it is. We jumped all the way to verse 25. Verse 25 is a summary statement of the whole point of the chapter. Here it is. All of it's going to start to make sense. Number one, salvation which comes from Jesus is everlasting. I think we know this. I think we understand this. Number two, Jesus is constantly stepping in the gap. Jesus is interceding on behalf of God's children. Number three, the eternity of salvation and intercession are for those who draw near to God. Let's read verse 25 again. Consequently, what does that word represent? Everything that I have been talking about up to this point, even if you don't understand it, All of it is moving, is funneling into this one point, verse 25. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost, Jesus, those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. God has made a way to be reconciled to God. Our sinful nature has broken our ability to know and understand God, and yet God pursues. And God creates a way for us to understand that brokenness and for us to understand his beauty and his glory and his love for his creation. And in the Old Testament, God shows his love and his pursuit through the office of the priest. But in the New Testament, this reconciliation is made possible only through the Son of God, Jesus, the great high God priest. There's the connection. God started an entire system to show us the exclusiveness of Jesus. You see, the author of Hebrews is stating a radical and and eternally important fact. A religious system that that has been in place for over 1,400 years and actually that religious system continues, has now been replaced with Jesus. This is huge. An entire people descended from Abraham understand the character of God because of the priestly duty that was given to the Levites. They understand that once a year in the Day of Atonement, the priest had to enter in. We've talked about this in Hebrews. And they had to engage in the most holy of holies to 
pay penalty for their own sin and then to pay penalty for the sin of the nation. And they did that once a year. And what God is saying is all of that was to show that it had to happen over and over and over again every single year because there wasn't enough blood and enough bulls and in enough birds to provide for the sin of people. And so Jesus has come. And Jesus has come so that we might have hope. Jesus has come so that we no longer have to sacrifice animals. We can accept his ultimate forever sacrifice for the forgiveness of sin. The question as this kind of all this mumble, jumble facts rattle around in your head. The question is this. Do you understand what's at stake when you consider Jesus? Do you consider your relationships out there, your relationships with your family, your relationships with your coworkers, your relationships with your fellow students, your relationships with all the people that you interact with on a daily basis, do you consider your relationships with eternity at the forefront of your heart and mind? Do you consider your own actions with the holiness of God at the center of of your affections? Those are two very powerful and hard-hitting questions. As you consider the answers to those questions, I want you to hear from the mouth of Isaiah what he said, what he uttered through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in his life, what he wrote down in Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 5, when he came into contact with what was at stake. This is what the prophet Isaiah said. In the year that King Uzziah died, when everything seemed hopeless. That's basically what he's saying. I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne. I saw Jesus sitting on a throne, high and lifted up. Put yourself there. Allow the imagery, allow the explanation to draw you into what Isaiah is saying about Jesus. The train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each, (laughs) put yourself in the explanation of these strange creatures. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, Holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. He is so holy, you have to say it three times to even come to a point of understanding his holiness. And the foundations of the threshold shook, and the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. Just imagine if that happened right here, right now, where would you be? I would be underneath the chairs. Imagine what's happening with Isaiah coming into contact with the beauty and the awe and the fear of Jesus. And I said, Isaiah says, woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips. When I'm in your presence, I am so unworthy, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King. The Lord of hosts, the God who gives hope. Paul says it this way, not without splendor, but a little less than how Isaiah says it in Philippians chapter 3, verse 8. Indeed, Paul says, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as a pile of trash in order that I may gain Christ. Melchizedek foreshadows Jesus, and the question that we have as we read verse 25, consequently, all of the stuff that we're considering, he, Jesus, is able to save to the uttermost forever those who draw near to God Through him, since he always lives, he sits at the right hand of the Father to make intercession for those who draw near to God. Do you consider 
your relationships with eternity at the forefront of your heart and your soul and your mind? Do you realize what's at stake? Do you understand the second part of that verse is not just the worth of God, but that Jesus is continually interceding for you? What does that mean? Jesus is not the past only. Jesus is not static. He's not simply historic. We're not just celebrating the birth of Jesus and then we go to his tomb another day and say, wow, what a great man. Let's celebrate the memorial of Jesus. Jesus is alive. That's the beauty of Christmas. That's the celebration that we have as his children. He lasts forever. Romans 8.34 says, Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised. So it is at the right hand of God who indeed is interceding for us. He didn't just die on the cross, get raised to life on the third day by the power of God, and then sits next to God and say, Whew, my work is done. That's not Jesus. Jesus daily, do you capture the importance, the, the emphasis of, of the impact of who Christ is? He is daily interceding for you. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, my little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, and all of us say, yes, I do, you and I have an advocate Someone who is advocating on our behalf daily with the Father, Jesus Christ. Where's the peace to be found? In the righteousness of Jesus. Jesus is praying every day. This blows my mind. Jesus is praying every day that your faith, that my faith, that the faith of Second Mile, that the faith of all the churches in the city of Tucson, that the faith that makes up the global church in this thing we call earth, that our faith will not fail. That is what Jesus is praying. Jesus prays this prayer as an example for us of Peter. Luke chapter 22, verses 31 through 32. You know the story. It's at the crucifixion, when Jesus has been arrested, when all of his followers scatter, when they're scared to death of what's about to happen to them. And this is what Jesus says about Peter, Simon, Simon. Behold, Satan demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat. Here are the words, the affectionate, glorious, beautiful, intentional, caring I've got your back words of Jesus to Peter. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Even when you disappoint yourself, your faith will stay intact. Because even though you will deny me three times, when you are restored... Strengthen those around you. Jesus is praying for your restoration. He's praying that your faith will come into full effect. He's praying that you will influence people because of what is at stake. The last thing is not only understanding the worth of God and not only understanding that Jesus is continually interceding, but to understand that he is saying that this is true of those who draw near to God. The, the word usage of draw near to God in the original Greek language is a present continuous action. It's not something that happens in the past. It's not something that happened once and then it never happens again. Those who draw near to God mean that daily and continuously they always are in the participation and the active reality of drawing near to God. If you have a relationship with Christ, you are daily engaging in that relationship. To close tonight, and I did get through all of chapter 7. Why do we care about Melchizedek? We care about Melchizedek because he is an earthly example that creates a roadmap to inform us about the character and mission of Jesus. That's why we care. 
because he points us to an even greater individual, Jesus. Why do we seek God? We seek God not to make us happy, not to find peace, not to create a scenario where we feel better about ourselves. We seek God to find and live a clearer vision of Jesus. When we embrace and understand and live the righteousness of Jesus, then you will have peace. So here's the last set of questions for you. What does your life actively display concerning your faith in Jesus. Present, continuous action. Does Jesus make a tangible difference in your everyday life? Tangible. Whoever you interact with today, they say you're different than you were yesterday. Because your relationship with Jesus is not static, it's dynamic. Do you search the word of God to gain a greater knowledge of the beauty and glory of Jesus? I get it. This chapter is tough. You have to know the history of the Israelites and who Abraham is and what's the role of the Levites and what's this whole thing about the priesthood. And I get it. And it's not just reserved for seminarians. This book was not written for the theologians in seminaries across this world to argue about what's true and what's false. This book was written for you and me. This book was written for people who didn't even know how to read This book was written for us to understand, and we have the glorious privilege of going anywhere and buying a Bible and opening it and reading it for ourselves. Do you search the knowledge of Scripture so that you can come into an understanding of who Jesus is? As you start this Christmas season, as you ponder the candle that represents hope, as you think and meditate about the mystery and the joy of Emmanuel, God with us, are you actively pursuing a great high priest and by understanding his righteousness, he will begin to give you peace? God, I ask that this would not have just been gymnastics when it comes to our ability to pay attention. God, I pray that your truth is present in your word. I know that it is. You have promised that it is. You have told us even through this book, Hebrews, that it is more powerful than a double-edged sword, sharper than anything that we can imagine, able to penetrate bone and marrow to get to the heart of the issue. Let us get to the heart of our passivity when it comes to your righteousness. Let us get to the heart of being people who actively display your glory, not to make big of ourselves, but to make known the greatness of your name. Let us be people of your word. Let us find the strength and resolve to worship you with everything that we are. Let us consider the role that you have as our king and as our priest. And let us be overwhelmed with thanksgiving. Move us to be people who think about eternity.